Once you've fallen in love with biology and you then go on to write a book that makes you internationally famous, The Selfish Gene, was that a process of gradual evolution coming to the conclusions that, were, that are in that book? Or was there any sense in which it was something of an epiphany? Hmm. Um, around that time, uh, there was, around the 1960s, there was a number of popular books written by people like Conrad Lawrence, Robert Audrey, uh, which portrayed evolution in an erroneous way. They made out that natural selection works at the level of the group or species and ac accounted for... Actually, I'm a bit... I'm a bit perky. I invite you all to have a drink, but... Uh, <laughs> Perhaps I should <clears throat> make my apology. Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I've had a stroke. <laughs> Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. <laughs> so if I sink to croaks and squawking, Josh will have to do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the 1960s, there were these books which accounted for things like altruism, cooperation, the, the way that aggression is ritualized and muted instead of being all-out fight to the death, accounted for them was the idea that natural selection chooses between groups. And those groups in which individuals are altruistic or cooperative or don't fight to the death are more likely to survive than groups in which they are selfish and fight to the death. That's just wrong. Uh, and I wanted to write a book to put it right. Um, I mean, it wasn't my idea that it was wrong. It's wrong by the standards of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which all biologists accept. Um, so I fell to thinking about the right way to express it. And about that time, 1964, a couple of very important papers were published by W.D. Hamilton, then a graduate student, the University of London, uh, which, if, if, if read properly, gave the idea that the unit of, of natural selection is actually the gene. And things like altruism are best explained as, a, a result, are often best explained as a result of kinship. Um, animals who are kin, close kin, brothers and sisters, nephews and nieces, and so on, uh, are statistically likely to share genes. Therefore, a gene for altruism is likely to be shared with brothers and nephews and nieces and sisters and things. And so altruism towards those close relatives will be favored by natural selection because the gene for it is actually carried in the body of the relative which is, who, is, who, is favored, who is favored. So that led me to a sort of vision of natural selection at the level of the gene. And I, and I thought of the individual organism as a survival machine for the genes that ride inside it. So if an animal survives to reproduce, then the genes that helped it to survive get passed on to future generations. So as the generations go by, there's a kind of filtering, sieving process, whereby genes that are good at making bodies survive and reproduce are the ones that we see, are the ones that, and therefore the bodies that we see are the ones that are built by it. Looking backwards, you can say that every individual alive is descended from a literally unbroken line of successful ancestors, every single one of whom survived childhood and every single one of whom achieved at least one heterosexual copulation. That cannot be said of the majority of animals that have ever lived, but it can be said of those who did become ancestors. Ancestors are rare, descendants are common. Um, so I gave a course of lectures in Oxford in 1966, which propounded this view uh, of the selfish gene. And then um, in the 1970s, I finally got a sabbatical leave at Oxford and decided to put it all down in a, in a book. I'd actually forgotten that I had lecture notes from that early period, and I, and I found them again much more recently, and I was quite startled by the fact that in 1966 
the, the central rhetoric of the selfish gene, that's say ten years earlier than the book, the central rhetoric of the selfish gene was already there in my lecture notes, the idea of Im immortal genes skipping like chamois down the generations, that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that, I think that answers your question. Mm. I, I, you reminded me there of uh, a metaphor that you have, which is to imagine a, a picture book which you can flip through to create a little cartoon sort of thing, in which there's a photo of me, and then a photo of my mother, and a photo of her mother, yeah. her mother, and her mother. Yes. Going back, can you just tell us that? Explain well, that metaphor. Um, for this, this is a, this is a way of um, of partly expressing the, the great span of time, um, and that if you have all these photos stacked on top of each other, um, how how far? How, how, how big a stack of photos would you have to, to, to make in order to get back to, shall we say, Lucy three, three million years ago, or shall we say, um, your fish ancestors um, in the Devonian <laughs> period? And the answer, of course, is that the stack of photographs would be beyond imagining. It would be, um, I think you'd have to, um, I think to get back to, to Lucy, you've got, a, you've got a pile of photos that would be the height of the Empire State Building or something like that, and then um, to get back to the fish, it would be, um, you'd have to put them in a, in a bookshelf and it would stretch for about, I mean, 40 miles or something, I forget the exact uh, uh, deep details. But I also use this metaphor to make the important point that although we are descended from fish, there was never a moment when there was a sudden transition. Every one of these photos, as you go along this 40 mile long shelf, starting with yourself, then your mother, then your grandmother, and so on. Every one of them is almost exactly the same as, the, as its neighbors in the, in the series. Every, every animal ever born was a member of the same species as its parents and its children. And yet, if you, if you stack enough of them on end together, you get back to a fish. There never was a moment when, say, a pair of Homo erectus parents looked lovingly into some Pliocene cradle <laughs> and said, we've given birth to the first Homo sapiens. <laughs> it, it was never like that. There never was a first Homo sapiens. This is one of the most difficult things for people to, to grasp. They sort of think, well, there, there must have been a first human, mustn't there? No, there wasn't, because the first human had parents and grandparents, and they had parents, and they had parents. Gradually, 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 as you walk along the line, you will, you will, see, you will see change, but the, the change is so slow, so gradual, that you have to walk miles along the line before you really notice it. But eventually, if you walk far enough, you'll come to a fish. 